We're going to talk about motivation for the next half hour. The reason we're going to talk about motivation is really because it came up as the number one thing that people were concerned about because they're losing kids, achievements getting lost. And so there's another dimension of, of ed tech when it comes to what to do about motivation. So I'm going to sort of start walking you guys through that. I'm going to be watching for comments along the way. I'm going to go through it really quickly. So we have time to discuss before we end off. If there's no real chatter, then we'll just end early. But um, motivation, like I said, is, is number one. It's 85% of schools and districts are concerned about this because like Leslie was just saying, and Jason, there's some kids that are maybe remote. If you're simultaneously teaching you're worried about motivating them. You're also worried about motivating the ones in the classroom. And there's some new tricks that we want to share with you that we have figured out over the course of the last year. So first of all, the book that inspired us, and we had Dr. Cheryl Abshire talking about this a lot last fall, but it was a book called The Motivation Breakthrough. And if you have a chance to get it from Amazon, please do. It's Six Secrets to Turning on the Tune Out Child. We kind of updated our understanding of it because it's not a very new book, but it's awesome. And it has a lot of really interesting information. So let me give you the learning council view of that data. So first of all, I talked earlier about the major shift. Our concern is traditional public needs to not only pay attention to its digital side, it needs to pay addition to its human side. So there's already a big trend of social emotional learning, but let's talk about what the teacher is doing with the way kids are, because they're all individual little human beings and they're all different, um, in front of them or coming in over the web in uh, live virtual conferencing and how they're using that. So we, we in this book, um, The Motivation Breakthrough, there's basically eight forces that motivate kids. One is gregariousness. They're just like friendly little kids um, or older kids. Uh, autonomy. They, they uh are trying to define their own autonomy as a being. Um, their status, their status happy kids. Um, they're inquisitive. They just wanna find things out. Um, they're aggressive. Um, they're contesting things you say or always wanting to comment on things you say. They're power hungry. Um, not a strange motivation in humanity. A lot of kids are motivated this way. They want to Um, demonstrate that by participation or by running a small group or something like that, or they're looking for recognition. They want the rewards Um, or they're affiliation oriented, which means they're part of this thing. And as long as it's acknowledged that they're being part of whatever it is, a small group, a whole group, a club, um, a group of friends, they feel like they're motivated. Um, This is one of the ones that is the most in jeopardy And the most complicit in seeing lost achievement, lost engagement is the kids that are either the gregarious kids or the affiliation motivated kids because they're not part of the old way of doing things, always being in a class. And that is really messing with their motivation right now. So that's just something to pay attention to. Let me talk about what are the secrets behind those. So projects, whether they're digital projects or hands-on, go do the laundry at home with a certain kind of thing and then give us the laundry experiment report back or a cooking experiment you can do at home or, you know, uh, growing a plant or whatever, or go around the backyard with a plant detecting app and tell me which kind of plants you found in your yard. All those little projects um, motivate that autonomous or inquisitive child. The autonomous child is motivated by being able to come back and do something that they did on their own. They love this. Um, Inquisitive child's like, I want to find out something new. Um, Then there's the people motivated child. Again, these are the ones that have dropped off the radar the most nationally. Kids that are motivated um, by gregariousness or they're also their their affiliation driven child. They like to be part of groups. Um, Those are the ones that are most concerned right now nationally because they don't feel like they're learning unless they're getting motivated by other people. Maybe that's not just the teacher. So the attention in 2021 of what's going on between kids needs to go way up. Um, And then praise, kids are motivated um, by the status of praise, getting a gold star, uh, recognition or affiliation driven child. All of those have elements of needing to be praised in order to sort of move along. That's hard to do when you're trying to chat with people and acknowledge people that are in front of you at the same time. Um, And then you got the prize motivated child. 
those are the status ones, the affiliation or power driven child. They're also motivated by prizes. Prestige is also motivating to the autonomous status, aggressive or power driven child. Prestige could come in the form of grades. It could come in form of, you know, acknowledgement from all the way up at the principal level uh, and that kind of thing. And then power, um, motivating the power, uh, that motivates the uh, power autonomous or aggressive child. That's things like you open the team's meeting. Now you say something to the whole group or you're going to run this small group over here. Those, you know, because you can do that in um, Zoom and Teams and that kind of thing. You can run small groups. Giving little things that um, allow that power motivated child to continue to feel like they have an element of power in the whole subject of being uh, educated. That's something that has gone missing also in a lot of this whole transition. People forgot to pay attention to that kind of thing that motivates those kinds of kids. Um, so these are the secrets of, of how to motivate the different types. Projects, attention to people, attention to praise, attention to prizes, attention to prestige and power. The six, the, is it six, six Ps? So the main thing is, is you never want to share your observation or your labels of students with students. Once teachers find out what we, I just showed you in the last couple of slides, or they read that book. Um, one of the main things we want to stress is you never share, oh, you're a power motivated child with the child themselves. That would be a mistake. Um, so let's talk about what tech does in this whole uh, structure of, of how um, students learn. So first of all, tech motivates when it's done well. It doesn't motivate if it's not done well, it has poor user interface, poor user experience, or it's a navigational nightmare just to get the kid logged in. All the problems that have to do with how you find things, get into things, username, passwords, where is it? Is it in the subfolder of the subfolder in the social studies wing of the system? Or is it over here in this other folder? Or do I have to go out to a different site? This is very messy. Um, and so you can't really think that tech is gonna motivate anybody if it's not done well. And that all comes down to navigational issues. And secondly, the user interface issue of how uh, graphical the interface is, if the menu is in the right place. These are all things that I'm saying right now that are part of the new EduJedi standards that we're gonna talk about tomorrow. For example, you don't wanna buy a system um, of any type of curriculum that has 404 errors, right? Like you go to a page and it says, oh, 404 error, and it doesn't give the student a redirect automatically. It has to be built that way at the back end of the software. And if you don't redirect students away from 404 errors, they get lost. They don't know where to go back to. Maybe they don't know they're supposed to go to the back button or the back button doesn't work. They just got an error. Now they got to log out, log back in. Very messy stuff. Um, so another way you can let tech do it, and this is an example of, of Scribble system, is that projects that motivate um, the autonomous or inquisitive child are all over the head tech space. And those are different things than do the regular just text-based curriculum or a Google Doc or a PDF or something. And you can even use uh, long distance robotics, um, AR, VR systems, and provide other digital things that allow those kids um, to do discovery-based learning. So in the project area of motivation, there's a huge number of ideas. And we're suggesting to schools right now to get together teachers to talk about how they can do more projects online that even the kids that are in class can participate in, or maybe they're running the experiments of the kids that are distance. So they're doing the hands-on and the kids are telling them how to do them that are, that are exterior and remote. Another way you can, um, let tech do it is the, the people motivated uh, child, the gregarious or affiliation driven child. They can use things like um, portfolio apps like Bulb or Seesaw. They can use social media, including No Story, um, form their own groups. They, they can use animation apps like Plotagon, where you get to use the little pre animated characters to carry out little skits so that you can show that as your proof of work rather than. Um, just write an essay, you can show it in a different way with people that helps the people motivated child. Okay, another way that you can let tech do things in order to use prestige to motivate the autonomous status, aggressive or power driven style is the, the crafted courseware that's in the market now. And there's, there's hundreds of these companies. 
Um, they're built for high engagement and they allow for personal progress reporting back to the student themselves. And they give chances to control um, how you as a student get up to the next level. This is different than when I talked about hybrid logistics. This is embedded in the adaptive digital courseware. Um, but a child will get like a little gold star or a little fireworks will go off. And that's all telling their mind there's prestige in their achievement. Um, so when you're looking at software, you're thinking of these six P's and saying, is it hitting some of those? And one of the ways it can hit them is like I said, little stars going off or dancing widgets on the screen telling the child, oh yeah, you did something, you're done. Um, go to the next level. Those are, those are the way that tech is helping you with that um, motivation piece. Another thing about prize, praise and prizes that motivate that recognition or affiliation driven child is software that shows your own progress or what you're supposed to be doing next. Classlink showed this a little bit, like in terms of the graphics that show the teacher or how you progress. A lot of software shows the student themselves. You're progressing along, here's what your next step is. That really helps students because they feel like they're getting towards a prize, giving little stars and coins and um, other sort of rewards within the systems is another way that tech is doing this for you to motivate students. Now, the schools that are missing out on this are ones that are going, we're just going to Zoom me. Like Leslie was talking about, like that wasn't working. You got to have a different sort of structure to how you're going to teach. You can't just Zoom and PowerPoint all day. Um, the ones that are doing that or else they're just passing out PDFs via email back and forth that doesn't actually hit these points of motivation because those are all missing when you're not in person. If you're in person, the teacher can eyeball on you and smile, you know, give you a little thumbs up. Um, but if you're not getting that when you're at home, you're missing a huge point of what motivates certain kids and actually eyeballing what is the motivation of each child, each child that's gonna help you as a teacher. And there's, there's some tests um, little tiny quizzes or a little uh, sort of look at it and analyze that student in the book. Um, and we also have those available at Learning Council. They've been updated by Learning Council and a little PDF we can give you if you want it. Um, another way to let tech do it with a power motivated child, they want to be, they want to have some power. They want to demonstrate that they're in charge of something. Um, letting them be the question leader um, in one hour of the day. Um, being an autonomous or aggressive child, anything that's going to show that they have some power is, is a motivation that could go missing in all the online one way that a lot of schools have been doing. One of the technologies in that field is light speed, which is, you know, the handheld speakers. Now that we all have to be socially distanced, you might have to spray them down or only allow one at one table at a time um, and separate them all out, have more pieces of equipment. But that audio need, that need to be able to share out and have a little power to be able to press the button and you speak is, is an element of power that we think is also an important one to take a look at for now that you have to have socially distanced classrooms in so many places. Okay, another way to, uh, you can let tech do things is there's new things coming out, both from No Story for Hybrid Logistics as a demonstration, so the whole market can get on board and start using that kind of stuff. But also these things like from Alilo, if you haven't heard of them, um, they have AI avatar-based training, which allows your teachers to say, you know, these are the 56 lectures I'm gonna give in uh, science this year. I'm gonna pre-do some of those um, in Alilo as um, a little avatar body, delivering this for kids to be interactive. They can slow it down, speed it up. It's gonna pelt the student with questions. It's gonna learn which questions are often not answered correctly. Come back to me as a teacher, I can reword the question. I can put other ways in to teach that part. Um, but that AI uh, using a stand-in for the teacher for parts of what they deliver is now coming into this market. It's been really popular in the military arena for a really long time. It's great in language learning, math learning, anything that might have some repetition is the easiest sort of start in to this true AI. It doesn't replace the teacher. Teachers still need it because you have to um, end off on what the teacher wants you to do uh, next or how the teacher is gonna uh, execute it within their lesson structure. It's not the whole lesson structure, it's just a piece of it. 
So that's another way you can do that. Um, and and it, I just want to end off on that part, which is saying that the only effective long-term motivator to order to get back some of your achievement that you need to get back in 2021 is, is feeling like you've had success. So whatever you do this year with motivation, you need to be focused on every student home or in class, wherever they are, they feel like they're winning. This is a success. Um, everything's great, that kind of thing. And then, um, you know, students experience success in academics or social tasks. Um, they become increasingly motivated. So no matter which end, but don't forget those pieces of motivation and really eyeballing your kids to see what motivates them. Because if you, if you really look, you're going to notice what we've been noticing at Learning Council, what, what changed with kids at home that they're not seeing anymore. And so they're dropping off the radar because they're not motivated because of the way they're motivated. Okay, so our final challenge to you is, and um, please, you know, start raising your hands or type in some questions, um, is let tech do some work to motivate your students and have an eye to those different types of motivations. Is it praise? Is it prizes? Is it prestige? Does this kid need to feel like they're empowered to be something, that they get to lead something? Are they missing friends? There's not enough chit chat with other kids because they're, they're not in hallways anymore hanging out. Um, they're not going to lunch together anymore. Even if they are, they might be dis socially distanced. It's very awkward. What can we do to increase that feeling of people um, and humanity again? And then also, you know, use appropriate tech for the individual. I mean, this is a new sort of higher level to your thinking now going into 2021. What's the next level up? How do we personalize? What is this kid missing in terms of what motivates them? Um, and sometimes what's really missing is human know-how, just eyeballing that kid and going, you know, they used to be so active in class and now um, they have to be online because of whatever all the time. And they're just not showing up. They're not engaged. Their grades are dropping. What is going on? And figure that out so that you can execute on what will fix it because it may not be the academics. It might be one of these motivation factors. So I just want to bring that up with everyone today um, and then let you know, you know, we're going to give you Edu Jedi badges. You have to get them in no story for completing both the hybrid logistics today and the student motivation today. Um, I'm going to go back one slide and just come back up to this for a minute and make sure anybody that hasn't commented comments. I'm also going to have Doug unmute everybody right now that's left on the line so I can hear from you and have you comment on anything. Um, Jason, I see you're still on the line and so is Leslie. Do you guys want to unmute and make any comments about what I just went through really quickly? Well, Lonnie, I can say that um, the Student motivation is one of the biggest things that our teachers bring up that's an uh, obstacle. Um, so some of these things that you brought up is, are definitely uh, points of emphasis that we can use you moving forward to just get some different ideas on how to address that and help them better motivate. And some of the pieces as far as like the students being able to see their progress, it depends on the kid. I mean, in Edgenuity, those, our students are put on an assignment calendar and they can see if they're on track or not. We were laughing that years ago, an old version of A-plus software um, had apples and the kids earned their apples. And, and it was amazing a little bit how much you could tell a kid, you know, okay, you need to earn two apples today. And even our high school students would go earn their apples. So... So there is some truth to just that little bit of a badge or seeing your progress and knowing or being motivated that I know if I get this done, then I'm done. It's That's my homework for today or whatever. Yeah, those are big ones. I think, like I said, the ones that I'm more concerned about are these kids that are motivated by the dynamics of interaction with uh, people because they're little friendly people, like they just want to be like people, people. And then the ones that are, are really motivated by affiliation, like a sense of belongingness, because I think that's what we sacrificed the most in the last year. And those are the kids that I think are seeing the most loss of achievement. They just sort of wilted. 
So what are your thoughts on those kinds of kids? How motivating them? Well, we're, we're, we're coming back to in-person instruction on February 8th. Um, that part, I think some of our teachers, you know, have done some, some interesting things that, that help those kiddos um, with using Microsoft Teams and the functionality of being able to set off those off groups and, and they collaborate in these, in those separate groups. Mm -hmm. um, but my, I, Leslie just said, my daughter's one of these that you're talking about. And uh, <laughs> she's in one of our high schools. <laughs> yeah. And her, you know, her GPA dropped first semester because she just really just had motivation issues and stuff. So um, she's excited now. And, and, you know, one thing I said to Leslie this morning about, about my daughter is, is, I think we look at academics and measures all the time and, and previously, and I, I just have struggled with it for the whole semester with our, my daughter and my, my wife and I, and, and uh, trying to look at the positive of this. And I'm like, you know, the one thing she said to us recently is, is, yeah, I'm, I'm good now guys. I'm good. I, I got it figured out and stuff. And I think some of the lessons she learned from that, that semester and having a tough stretch there and figuring out how to overcome that, I, you, you can't replace that or take that away from. Um, so some of those things are struggles that if they overcome them and we help them overcome them, they can actually, I think, end up being a positive for, for kiddos in the end. So we just have to get past the, yeah, she, is she going to have some academic learning gaps in there? Probably a little bit. She didn't achieve where she normally does, but, um, you know, with the life experience she gained and, and her self-confidence through that, I think of, of negotiating a difficult semester for her and the emotions involved with all that are, I, I think that's, that's also a learning experience as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big deal. Yeah. Because if you're motivated by people and you literally can't have people around, you're going to have to learn to get over it or, you know, figure it out a different way. I think one of the suggestions we also heard um, along the way in one of the other webinars was, um, putting together teams meetings that are just for kids, like giving one of your little power hungry kid or aggressive kids, their ability to pull together one. And like, there's no adult on there. That's a little scary for a lot of school districts, right? Yeah. That sounds scary. Or maybe you have a moderator that's like not even in that grade or isn't one of the regular teachers. They're over in some other place and they're just there to moderate. They're just lurkers. So you, nobody uses swear words or does anything strange but kids can just talk, right? Um, that putting together a different type of socialness is kind of what I'm saying. That has been one of the missing parts. One um, of the things our district did, even though the benchmarks were saying, you know, don't come back to school, um, we kept athletics going. So our students still had that piece. And in our activities areas, um, where you don't physically have to be together to do the activity, but we encouraged um, our clubs still to meet. You can meet on teams. You don't necessarily have to come to campus, but still do your club meetings and still do activities. So um, we didn't have the club sponsor step off the meeting, um, but we did have them. We said, you're still going to get your stipends for, you know, coaching and clubs and stuff. If you keep them running, even in, an online environment, and we even had one of our um, campuses do an entire online play production. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, I love that. That's yeah, So they really found cool. ways to keep students involved in the activities, even though it wasn't, you know, the traditional way. Good, <clears throat> good. Yeah, so that, so that was really the point of this whole conversation. And everybody that's still on the line, I'm watching you. You can speak up at any time. I think most of you have been unmuted or you can unmute. Um, I'm gonna, oh, so here's a comment. Um, Patrick, I think you're unmuted if you wanna make your comment. Yeah, thank you, Leilani. I, I just wrote uh, on the comment there, we need to gamify things, make things challenging and make it fun and entertaining. Um, and then uh, I ask this question a lot and many people don't know this even in the educational realm and that is, uh, a root word of education is educe. Educe means to pull, to draw forth from, mm. pull out of people. 
And um, wow. really, I mean, we kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, you know, don't just look at their eyes, don't look at their body language. And I, I agree with that, but I think those give us very good insights into people. Mm. And if they look away or look down or cross their arms, or there's a lot of ways to determine it. But I think we also ask very good questions, follow up and do a little bit of probing uh, in a very kind and gentle way to make sure that uh, we know exactly where they're at and how we can best help and support them. Yeah. Yeah. Pull it out of them. And that's yeah. what we're saying is going to happen th- across this year. So, you know, the gamification I think is really great. Um, pulling things out of kids that are not motivated by, you know, prizes or praise and games or prestige. They're motivated by people. Right. That's, that's the real struggle point right now. Because right. even when you're in school, like 90% of America, they're going to have to make you socially distance. The whole thing feels different than the humanity of before. Yep. And, and so I think where we're going to have continue to see struggle is the people motivated people, the ones that are affiliated by human affiliation. And that's going to happen with a lot of the teachers because most, you know, I would say 90% of the teachers are teaching because they love kids. They love humans. They love being there, you know? And so we have, we have this to struggle with in 2021, more, more probably than anything else. And I showed you a lot of where tech can come into play. What were your thoughts also, Patrick, on the gamification aspects, like using that as teachers? Yeah, I think, and again, this is not going to be to every individual. And that's why I followed up with Educe, and that's to find out what motivates people And I think many, not all, are challenged by um, the the motivation of challenging them and using games, and I don't mean actually specifically games, but figure out what does motivate people and then try to, we talked earlier about the individualization of the instruction. And I think that's where we're going. In fact, I I have a, a family member a uh, very intelligent individual. And he actually dropped out of high school because he just said, you know, they're, they're just not teaching me what I want to learn. Well, that goes to educe. Mm-hmm. What do you want to learn? And then find out what they're trying to do. And I don't think in every case we can make it so individualized that, you know, we're going to accommodate everyone. I think that's unrealistic. But I think it gives them, as I said, gives them a voice that they have a little bit of uh, ability to feel that they have a say in what the instruction is for them as well, as opposed to just taking what's being offered to them. Mm -hmm. Totally agree with you. And I have sympathy for that person in your family. I I will tell tell you that tomorrow we're going to talk a lot about the new standards and the new um, EduJedi instructional design model. And one of the legs of the design model is discovery-based design, which in a digital world is a totally different thing than Addie's model. Um, in terms of designing for the individual, it moves to more of a Socratic model, whereas kids like that, um, that they're not getting what they need. And maybe the mutation of the district hasn't gone to full personalization or is nowhere near it or whatever, then, then a discovery-based model becomes really interesting, maybe not for all of their learning, but in a cutaway of, uh, you know, name your own elective kind of a thing. Oh, you want to learn everything about the future of outer space and space force and blah, blah, blah. Let's design a little thing, unleash you into safari montage and all the systems and you figure it out, right? Right. Come back, write your thesis. And then we will adjudicate the uh, domain of your thesis. And then you go and when you come back, we'll judge it and, and give you a grade. That's, that's really one of the legs of the, what the learning council sees as the future is what we call discovery based learning. And there's been a lot of talk about that, but for kids like you're talking about, Patrick, that's critical. Yeah. Maybe start doing something like that now. Right. Cause yeah. they're, they're out otherwise. That's right. He dropped yeah. out and look at some of the biggest companies uh, in America right now. They're giving people pick your percentage, 15%, 20% of their time, you go do what you want to do and then come back and kind of report and keep us in the loop. And they're discovering uh, number one, and I believe this, I believe people are brilliant when put into their own space and what excites them about the learning. Uh, I think it's amazing what what we all do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'll make one, one other comment and then we'll wrap up everyone unless somebody types in more questions or raises their hand. Um, the, the model that we see happening, this is this is a little bit more of a clarification on where the, we think the future is going to go, 
is that right now we're in a modality of the bureaucratic structure. Everybody sort of lays down their learning, their lesson path in general at the pacing guide level, standards, pacing guide. And then individual lessons happen by individual teachers. And so you've got a course and class structure. It's a normalized pathway. And the fracturing off the normalization is not a full tangent or you know, two universes away from the norm. The norm remains the norm and there's slight little eddies off of it for slight customization. That's what's going on. We anticipate that what'll happen is people will lay down a normalized path for real and then, you know, not like teachers coming in and what am I going to do for a lesson next week? You know, all of them are laid for the year. So that what two things will happen. One, you can gate kids forward um, and they have to wait at those intersections of lectures or they get to jump over to another subject or whatever. You, you can pace kids differently. It's not necessarily competency based. It's just pace different. And, but the other thing that will happen is once you lay down your fully normalized path of the way things are going to run. And you say to yourself, let's not use these 26 math programs. Let's use one or two um, and let's normalize the path. Then what happens is way greater mutations can go on because once you have a, a road laid, you can start running different things on the road. You can start building out lots of tangents that accommodate the project driven child, the people driven child, the prestige driven, you can start to really customize. You can't do that if you maintain not laying down the road. Um, and so I think if we look at what will have to happen to fully get to individualization and personalization, we have to have first a normal. Um, and people are struggling with that right now um, because they're trying to do everything at once. But that's really where we see things starting to go. So if anybody wants to comment on that, I'm listening. Other than that, I'm going to start wrapping it up here. You guys have been great today, by the way. Jason, uh, Patrick, thanks for joining. Everybody else that's on the line right now. Leslie, you guys have been awesome. Thank you, Leilani. Always a pleasure. Yeah, pleasure. Hope to see you again live in person one of these days. That'll be awesome. I can't wait to visit again. And play golf you. in Phoenix. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to, hope to see everybody tomorrow. We're going to talk about um, standards and uh, digital learning experience and what it means. Thank you guys for being with us today. I'm going to wrap up here if I don't see any other questions in 10 seconds and I don't see anything. So 10, 9, 8. Thanks again, everybody, for being with us. This is Leilani Cawthon, your host with the Learning Council, thanking our panelists once again and all of you guys as attendees for being with us today. We hope to see you again tomorrow when we're gonna talk about something else with our, with our workshop set. All right, thanks for being with us. Goodbye for now.